Welcome to lesson three, the printing press. My name is Gabrielle and this is a third lesson in our Renaissance unit for Year 8 History. The printing press. What gunpowder did for war, the printing press has done for the mind by Wendell Phillips. Let's think about it. What effect did the invention of gunpowder have on war? Well, the answer is that gunpowder led to the invention of guns and handheld fast weapons like rifles. With these weapons, close combat between enemies was faster and more accurate than swords. If gunpowder made war faster and more deadly, then what effect do you think the printing press had on education? Well, the answer is that the printing press allowed for faster and wider spread of information. Books could be printed quickly, so more ordinary people could read them, not just church leaders. So we're going to watch a short video on a movable metal typeset and how this uh, technology or process worked on a printing press. Movable metal typeset printing is one of the greatest inventions of the last millennium. It revolutionized the way people created and produced books. But what exactly is movable typeset and why was it such a big deal? Before the movable type printing press was invented, books were expensive and either copied by hand or made using block printing. Copying books by hand was tedious and time consuming and scribes sometimes made copying errors. Block printing meant that texts and images had to be carved into blocks of wood, then covered with ink and stamped onto a page. These blocks were time consuming to create and use. By 1450, less than 30,000 books existed in all of Europe. All of this would change with the innovations of Johannes Gutenberg. In the late 1390s, Johannes Gutenberg was born into an upper class family in Mainz, Germany. He learned various crafts like blacksmithing, jewel cutting, and goldsmithing. Around 1450, he began developing new techniques for improving the printing press. Gutenberg created a process using movable metal type which meant that letters could be rearranged into countless patterns. This was faster and more accurate than any previous method. It made books and tracts much more affordable. Gutenberg's first major project was printing the Bible in Latin. By 1500, there were over 200 printing shops in Europe. It is estimated that between 8 and 20 million books were printed during those first 50 years. This type of printing press would lead to the mass production of the Bible. This meant that the Bible was more accessible and affordable to people than ever before. The effects of Gutenberg's invention were enormous. Ideas spread across Europe and the world faster than they ever had. This contributed to major cultural and intellectual movements such as the Renaissance, the Reformation, the Scientific Revolution, and the Enlightenment. Printed books, including the Bible, were more affordable for everyone. Gutenberg's innovations revolutionized the process of book production and the way people engaged with the Bible. All right, so that gives you a little bit of background information on what the printing press was, how it worked, and who invented it. But to really understand the impact of the printing press, we need to go back before the printing press and Johannes Gutenberg's invention. So before the printing press, the Chinese were actually using woodblock printing in the 800s, and this was about 600 years before Gutenberg. The Koreans actually invented movable metal type about 100 years before Gutenberg. So how was Gutenberg's press actually different? Well, Gutenberg adapted the ideas of the Chinese and the Koreans by installing a screw type press, which squeezed down evenly on the inked metal type, producing better quality pages. So what are the benefits of the printing press? Fast printing of books fast dissemination of knowledge. Dissemination means to spread. It was much cheaper than copying books by hand. 
The greater availability of books increased the literacy rate of Europeans because books eventually became inexpensive, which didn't encourage people to learn to read. The first mass-produced book was the Bible in Latin, of which there were about 180 printed copies. 49 of these copies survive in the world's museums and galleries, but most of these are incomplete. The last complete copy of a Gutenberg Bible sold in 1978 for $2.2 million. So how did the printing press work? Let's take a look at this interesting video from an American museum which uses uh, or which prints using a traditional printing press very similar to the one that Gutenberg invented. Here we have a representation of what Gutenberg's press might have looked like back in 1440, 1450. We don't know it exactly because nobody knows what his press exactly looked like. The earliest surviving printing press dates to you know, like 150 years after Gutenberg. The basic concept is here. This is based on the Gutenberg press that's actually in Germany, in Mainz, Germany, at the Gutenberg Museum. They built theirs in 1900. At the end of what looks like a giant hammer, is a wooden screw twisting up inside the press. This is a, a giant wooden nut. You barely see the end of the threads here. Gutenberg got this idea from a basic machine of his day, uh, a wine press or an olive oil press. So these machines already existed in some form. Gutenberg, of course, is gonna modify it, but here is a screw from a 15th century French wine press uh, that Ernie found on one of his trips with his uh, Model A Ford traveling around France and uh, found this in an antique store and then acquired it. So you've got the threads here. This one is four threads per foot. On the Gutenberg press, it's three threads per foot inside the nut. And that creates the power. Very powerful device. Your letters are locked up inside the middle part of the press. The wood that's around it's known as furniture. It's held in place by two opposing wedges, which are called coins, Q-U-O-I-N-S and they're locked inside of a metal frame called the chase on a stone inside of a wooden box known as the coffin. The first thing you have to do, and every time you want to print, you have to apply ink to the letters. That's why you have two people operating the press. One person really needs to keep their hands clean. They work with the paper, and they're going to be pulling the impression with the lever. The other one is going to be working with these things known as ink pads or ink balls. So you have a soft padding behind the leather. You work the ink around on the leather. It's a thick black paste, which I'll show you in just a moment. And then they would literally beat the type in that fashion. You can imagine how hard it is to keep the inking even from the top of the page to the bottom, from one page to the next. And you're using these kind of crude tools. If you ever had a chance to go to here in Southern California, we have the Huntington Library. They have one of the best copies of the Gutenberg Bible in the world. And if they ever let you like go behind the glass case and thumb through the pages, which they never will, I believe it's worth about $100 million, you would see how perfect the inking is on Gutenberg's printing. And yet this is the level of tools that he's working with. One of the interesting stories uh, about the ink balls here is relates to the fact that they had to be changed on a regular basis. Uh, ben Franklin, who we've been talking about, hated this job as an apprentice when he was working for his older brother, James, because of course, as the younger brother, he gets the wonderful jobs in the shop. So you would take off the leather and then replace it and tack it on. Well, when they worked with it, they actually weren't working with leather, they were working with rawhide. And so rawhide is really cheap. Leather getting tan, that's an expensive process. And the printers would use the cheaper material. So they would take it and put the new rawhide on there. But if you've ever seen rawhide, here's, here's an example of it. It's like what our animal, our dogs love to chew on. It's very stiff when it first comes off the animal. And the challenge here is actually to soften the rawhide. 
And like I said, Ben Franklin didn't like this job. So he would take the rawhide out behind the shop there and then he would dunk it. He would soak it in a bucket filled with cow's urine, a natural source of muric acid. Oh, he hated that job. Um, of course, I think you know getting to muric acid might have been just as worse in, the, in that process. And that wasn't even the worst part of the job. He had to leave it there soaking overnight and then come back the next day and you know wring it out. Oh. They used the ink balls up until oh about 1815 to 1825. So right around 1815 is when they finally invented something uh, to work better, which is a roller. And one of the unsung moments in printing history when that roller was developed. Still used on printing presses today. So we're gonna actually use an ink roller on our press. Now one of the things that Gutenberg had to invent was ink. You don't think about it, but ink is kind of an important part of our process. If we don't have ink, we're not printing. Now they had ink already in existence, uh, but the ink, like the scribes were using to write the books with the quill pens, is a water-based, is, is water-based. And as a fluid based in water, it does not work well on top of the metal letters Gutenberg had developed. Uh, water tends to beat up on metal surfaces. He needs something that's gonna spread into a thin layer. So something that is based in oil it also has to be tacky. Well, fortunately, in the year that Gutenberg was born in 1400, the Dutch in Holland invented oil painting. So Gutenberg took the recipe of the Dutch oil painters and modified it and turned it into a perfect printer's ink. It is a thick black paste. And it almost looks like, to the uninitiated, I describe it as black peanut butter. Simple ingredients that most of us have, have at our own home. The first one, uh, the color, is found in our fireplaces. Not the ashes, not the charcoal, not the wood, but soot. Soot is pure carbon. And they would scrape the soot, and Ben Franklin would do this when he made, would make his ink. You scrape the soot off the bricks and then you mix it up into a bucket filled with boiled linseed oil, which you can find at a hardware store these days. And they would mix it up and you get a nice thick black paste. So, so we're going to spread that out on our table. So the roller was invented around the year 1815 or so in England. It was actually by a printer experimenting on a weekend when his wife was away. And there in the kitchen, he boiled up on the stove two ingredients, glue, horse glue, and molasses rather sticky substance, and then poured it into a tube, a metal tube with a metal shaft down the middle, poured it in, chilled it, and when he pulled it out, he had a perfect rubber-like material, a smooth surface that works really well for the inking. Unfortunately, that, that worked very well on the printing presses. This is one of those unsung moments in printing history when that roller was invented because up until today, I mean, we still have rollers on our printing presses applying the ink to our, our plates for the printing. But in those years, that material, that substance was known as composition. It's a composition roller. Well, it is rather tasty for the rodents in the printing shop. And uh, so you learn to leave your rollers in safe places or hanging from the ceiling or something because they would come in. We have one roller here from one of our presses in the warehouse and you can actually see the gap in the teeth uh, from the rat who enjoyed that tasty composition and all. So it's one of the problems with composition rollers. Okay, so we are ready now to spread our ink out onto the table. Now we're ready to apply the ink to the letters inside Gutenberg's press. Now, as I apply the ink, you might, depending on the lighting, be able to actually see letters appear on the roller. Every time you ink, or every time you print, you have to apply ink to the type. That's why you have two people operating the press. One is doing the inking, and one is pulling the lever on the press. And technically, they actually had names to it, so when you're pounding the ink, 
onto the letters, that's known as the beater. The one who pulls the bar is known as the puller. So the puller and the beater work as a team throughout the day switching places. Keep their stamina up. We're going to place our paper on what's known as the timpan. Place it on the guides. This is, this is the timpan. This is known as the frisket with a window that holds it in place. Bring the paper on top of your type. We now grab a handle down here, which is called the rounce. We're about to rounce the coffin underneath the platen, the flat surface. That's connected to the giant screw in the middle. Now we must pull what was known in its day as the devil's tail, the long lever. Give it a good squeeze. This is the equivalent of working about 70 pounds per square inch. Two good operators. This is the equivalent of working a plow in the field all day. This is why you have to have a team of two that are switching places throughout the day. Uh, this is hard manual work. You get about 80 to 120 impressions an hour. Get our print sheet. That's an exact copy of what Gutenberg was printing back in 1450. One page of his famous book, the Gutenberg Bible. Now, he, he only printed the black. That, by the way, that is the actual size of one of the pages. It's a big book. When he closed up Gutenberg's Bible, it weighed you know, at least 50 up to 55 pounds. So he prints the black. You notice that open space there. Think about what that might be for. And it's not just a picture. It's really that space is for a large initial. That could be decorated like a picture, but the purpose of the initial and the size of it would tell the reader where they're at. So a very large initial in that space would be, say, the opening of a new book in the Bible. A smaller initial could be a new chapter or a new paragraph. Gutenberg prints all the black, lets those pages dry, and then you would buy the pages from Gutenberg, go down the street to the monastery, or, and they would then be hired to finish out the book. When this particular page got finished, this is what it ended up looking like. So you can see here, a much more decorated page. That space is now filled with a giant letter P in red with a picture of King Solomon in the middle. On the side, a giant letter I in blue, more decorations along the bottom. And across the top, the name of that book in the Old Testament, Petaboles Solomus, the parables of King Solomon. That would be typical for an opening to a book in the Bible, in Gutenberg's Bible, very ornate, this would be more typical of an average page, still beautiful, not as decorated. You can see the smaller initials on that side. Well, in five years, he got 180 books. That was pretty good. How many books did the scribe get down the street? One in five years, a Bible in five years. Gutenberg gets 180. He never called this a printing press, as I think we mentioned before. He called it my faster writing machine, because <laughs> that's how they name things in, in Germany. And it was a faster way of writing books. Well, that was definitely faster than, this machine is definitely faster than writing that book out by hand. But that was only the year 1450 when Gutenberg printed his Bibles. In the next 50 years after the printing of the Gutenberg Bible, 180 copies, think about or guess in your own mind how many books were printed all over Europe till the year 1500. And your answer is probably not that close. The answer is 12 million. All the books written by hand during Gutenberg's lifetime, from 1400 to 1450, by all the scribes around Europe, they estimate numbered around 20,000 total books, which is the size of, say, a middle school or a high school library. Then the next 50 years ago, from writing 20,000 books to printing 12 million books. So that's the change that we see happening uh, uh, due to the advent of the printing press there in the middle of the 15th century. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video about the printing press and learned something about how it works. Don't forget to do the quiz uh, for this lesson on our website to test your understanding of what we've covered so far. And please uh, join us for our next lesson 
Thanks for watching.